31 divers carry out critical missions all over L.A. The city's underwater dive team is extremely busy. Divers were called at least 55 times last year for evidence searches and recoveries. Their bravery and dedication has not gone unnoticed by L.A. City Council member Dennis Zine. Through cost-cutting and salary savings at his office, Zine was able to donate $10,000 to the unit for the purchase of equipment. It's an honor to help this unit so they'll have the funds, they'll have the equipment that they can purchase to protect Los Angeles. In spite of the difficulty of this job, many officers are still inspired to join the underwater unit. On this day, several were trying out to become team members. Officers say having good equipment is critical to their safety. Anytime you dive at all, even recreationally, you have a potential to die. If your equipment fails, you don't have an air source, you can't breathe underwater, you'll drown. Council member Zine points out that the underwater dive unit has a budget of only $10,000 a year. And that's only a fraction of what is needed to equip police divers. Zine says every little bit helps, and so he is encouraging his colleagues on the council to find ways to make similar donations. Near Exposition Park, I'm Saida Pagan for L.A. This Week. The LAPD is inviting the public to also support their efforts. To find out how you can help, call 213-473-8485 and ask for Sergeant David Mascarenas. Made in China labels are everywhere, but now city leaders are hoping made in Los Angeles labels will make a splash in the fashion industry. As Gil Reyes reports, a new logo promoting locally manufactured threads will become a familiar sight. Here it is, the winning entry in the designed and made in Los Angeles logo competition. The design will grace the hang tags and websites of popular apparel firms based in our city. You're employing a lot more people than people actually realize. Los Angeles is home to around 10,000 companies, supporting 100,000 jobs. Famous local brands include American Apparel, Loud Love Jewelry, and Youth Movement. By the way, Youth Movement's Colby Long designed this winning logo, a symbol of our city's commitment to take the industry to the next level. Meeting and talking with stakeholders about what they need and how to strengthen the fashion industry in Los Angeles. City leaders say recent improvements to LAX, the Port of LA, also road and rail infrastructure will speed up the transportation of goods to retailers worldwide. The city strengthens its commitment with plans for a new comprehensive online guide of local suppliers and designers. It will be a one-stop shop for someone who wants to do business in this city. And over the next few months, we'll strive to fulfill more of the industry's requests. That also includes promoting a consistent L.A. brand. This logo will help to do that, to help keep L.A. on the cutting edge of the fashion industry. In downtown L.A., Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. The winning logo beat out 22 others from local firms to represent L.A.'s fashion industry as a whole. And whether it's fashion or groceries or home goods, you'll likely find what you're looking for at a Target store. But you'll probably have to drive there first. Well, not anymore. An urban version of Target has just moved downtown to the delight of residents. This is one dog many Target shoppers will recognize. Bullseye, Target's ubiquitous mascot, was on hand to help open the new Los Angeles Central City Target downtown. How many of you shop Target? I shop Target. My kids shop Target. Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, there for the ribbon cutting ceremony, had to contend with Bullseye for the media spotlight. Hey, Bullseye. Hablas español. <laughs> the arrival of City Target at the Fig at 7th Shopping Center not only has the mayor and Bullseye excited, but many downtown dwellers as well, who no longer have to drive to nearby suburbs to shop at the popular store. The modified design concept caters to the urban shopper. For example, for our pet owners, um, you won't have to bother lugging the 40-pound bag of dog food up to your office 
We'll sell you a smaller seven to eight pound bag that's um, a lot more portable. 2012 not only marks Target's 50th anniversary, but in July the store also unveiled its new urban format, City Target. City Targets can now be found in Chicago, Seattle, and here in Los Angeles, in Westwood, as well as at this one at Fig at 7th downtown. I'm proud to report that this store, all 100,000 square feet of it, represents the largest retail lease signed in downtown L.A. in two decades. The mayor says the addition of City Target and many other projects downtown are making downtown the place to be. And with football coming and this convention center and the hotels, we're looking at the streetcar, we're looking at close to 100,000 people over the next 10 years. This is going to go a long way to be a game changer, to show other retailers that it's possible to be successful in a once forgotten part of the city. Once forgotten, but thriving today. A game changer for Target, the city, and residents. Or some may choose to call it a bullseye. The third L.A. City Target store is slated to open at the Beverly Connection next March. Members of the LA Galaxy recently paid a visit to some young soccer players, but not only did they teach the kids a few moves, they came bearing another big gift. These children from Sunrise Elementary School in Boyle Heights recently received a big gift from some of the biggest names in professional soccer. It all began last year with a promise from Anschutz Entertainment Group, or AEG, and its LA Galaxy team to build a professional quality soccer field at the school. So we came out to your school last year in October with our team, and it was right before we played in the MLS championship. And all of the players made a decision that if we won the MLS Cup, we were going to make sure we gave you a field as good as they. And true to their word, after the LA Galaxy won the MLS Cup in November, the school got its 35,000 square foot Tifway Bermuda grass field, the same kind of grass used at the Home Depot Center in Carson, the home of the LA Galaxy. The field will be shared by Sunrise Elementary and the adjacent Weingart East Los Angeles YMCA, which currently teaches physical education to more than 600 Sunrise school students. The new field is a far cry from the school's poorly kept field. You know what was here this time last year? Dirt. That's exactly right. It was all dirt. And unfortunately, you all had to play on dirt. And that's not fair. And we think you should have as good a field as the Galaxy and these guys and David Beckham and Robbie Keane. To commemorate the donation and installation of the brand new field, Galaxy players were on hand to conduct a soccer clinic with the children and sign autographs for their young fans. You could go on and be a Galaxy player, you could go on and be an attorney, a doctor, but it all begins here where you're at right now, making sure that you get those grades you need to succeed. There is, of course, one downside to having such a nice soccer field. When the bell rings, they don't want to go back to class. They're enjoying this grass too much. But these kids are also learning a much bigger lesson, that in order to achieve your dreams, you have to make goals on and off the field. The YMCA will also be using the field for their after-school soccer and football programs. Over two dozen kids suffering from cancer were treated to an afternoon they won't soon forget. They got to rub shoulders with Hollywood stars and become honorary LAPD officers for a day. Anita Bennett has more. The Sunshine Kids received a red carpet reception in Universal City from reserve officers in LAPD brass. I never thought the LA po Police Department was going to do this for us. It was very kind of them. The Sunshine Kids are seriously ill children who suffer from cancer. And once a year, they come to LA from across the U.S. and Canada to enjoy the sights, and they get sworn in as honorary LAPD officers. And I will faithfully discharge the duties. Then it was off to the waiting patrol cars for a special ride across town as they ran a code three complete with all the bells and whistles. And the LAPD officers brought the kids here to Raleigh Studios in Hollywood where they received the VIP treatment and they even got to meet some TV stars. It's pretty cool. I feel very special. Actually, when I was in the cars, I was, I was like, man, I feel famous.
As the Sunshine Kids enjoyed lunch, City Councilman Dennis Zine stopped by. This is a day that we give them to take a break from their chemotherapy, from the radiation, where they can come out and have a good time. Actor G.W. Bailey from The Closer helped organize the studio tour. They'll meet Kate. Kate Walsh will join them. Uh, private practice will we'll be touring their set. And Kate will come and come and spend some time with them. And they got to spend a little time with Police Chief Charlie Beck. They're great kids. This is a great, great thing that's being done. And I just want to let you know how much we welcome you and are inspired by what by what uh, what you're dealing with. Overall, it was a day of special memories that brought a little sunshine to these kids' lives. In Hollywood, I'm Anita Bennett for LA This Week. The trip was paid for by the Sunshine Kids Foundation and private donors. Another big change is taking off at LAX, and here again is Anita Bennett to tell us that the airport is getting a new multi-million dollar high-tech utility plant. As traffic around Los Angeles International Airport slows down in the evenings, after midnight, construction crews resume work on the next phase of the airport's massive modernization project. Tonight we're bringing in the combustion gas turbine. We call it a, it's, a, it's basically a cogeneration aspect of the new central utility plant. The gas turbine is one of two energy efficient generators brought in to power LAX's new $438 million utility plant. This new plant with its cooling tower will be 20,000 tons, so it's double the capacity of what was here before. That means better lighting, heating, and air conditioning for passengers. The buildings will be basically at what just the right temperature and will be very comfortable for them. As the delicate installation gets underway, a giant crane is used to hoist the 52-ton turbine into place. Now underneath the turbine generator is a set of rollers that are helping to ease it into the building. And on the other side, you'll find a team of about six workers helping to guide it along. And there's tugs little tug motors that will basically pull it into the building as the crane moves. Once all the work is complete, the new central utility plant is expected to go into operation in 2014. At LAX, I'm Anita Bennett for LA This Week. The new state-of-the-art facility will replace the airport's current plant, which was installed in 1961. A dog that survived a tragic loss finds a home. Families living in a housing project receive free computers, and the Hollywood skyline will soon change with the arrival of a new project. These stories and more in City Beat. Mikey, a one-year-old mixed terrier who loves children, was looking for a home, but was quickly swooped up by a member of council member Eric Garcetti's staff. Council President Herb Wesson shared Mikey's tragic story during the council's weekly pet adoption presentation. There was an automobile accident. Killed the entire family. The only person that survived, the only animal, companion animal that survived, was Mikey. Mikey, adopted by Garcetti's legislative deputy, Guy Lippa, now goes by Sandy, named after Dodgers legend Sandy Koufax. Councilmember Tony Cardenas has secured $1.2 million in city bond funds for the long-awaited Cesar Chavez Recreation Complex. This 41-acre facility, located in Sun Valley, sits on the former location of the Sheldon Arlita Landfill, which has been closed since 1974. The project, now in its third and final phase, will include baseball fields, soccer fields, and walking trails. The final phase of construction is expected to break ground early next year. Council members Joe Buscaino and Eric Garcetti recently paid a visit to the computer center at the Jordan Downs Housing Development in Watts, where they met with families who received a donation of computers from the city. The families who received computers participated in technology training classes offered by the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles. We learned about computers, how to uh, attach a resume to your email. I really appreciated the class and I really appreciate the people. The computer boot camp class and the computer donations are attempts to close the digital divide for those in underserved communities. Another star is coming to Hollywood Boulevard. Work has begun on the first phase of a large-scale transit-oriented housing and retail project being developed by DLJ Real Estate Capital and Claret West Development. 
the project, called Boulevard 6200, located at 6200 Hollywood Boulevard, will consist of 500 residential units, 80,000 square feet of retail space, and provide easy access to the Metro Red Line. Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa calls the $200 million project exactly the type of transit-oriented development Angelinos want and deserve. Boulevard 6200 is expected to be completed in October of 2014. And in this week's list of things to do, Dia de los Muertos at El Pueblo, trick-or-treating at the local library, and a chance to read your poetry to an audience. Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos celebrations are underway at Overa Street downtown. Starting Thursday, October 25th to Sunday, November 4th, Overa Street will be the site of a host of different activities meant to honor the dearly departed. There are also events for kids including mask coloring, necklace making, and flower painting. Overa Street is located at 125 Paseo de la Plaza, right across from Union Station. Call 213-485-8372 for information. Let the poet in you come out or listen to an eclectic group of poets at the last Saturday of the month poetry event at the Encino Tarzana Branch Library. Read a classic poem or your own poetry. Each reader will have six minutes. Sign-ups begin at 1.30 with the event lasting until 4 p.m. This is on Saturday, October 27th. The Encino Tarzana Branch Library is located at 18231 Ventura Boulevard in Tarzana. Call 818-343-1983 for details. And over at the Eagle Rock Branch Library, kids are invited to a Halloween party and costume parade on Tuesday, October 30th at 7 p.m. Kids are encouraged to come dressed in their Halloween costume for a fun evening filled with Halloween skits, treats, a costume contest, and a parade. The Eagle Rock Branch Library is located at 5027 Casper Avenue. Call 323-258-8078 for more information. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you could catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week. ser un buen vecino, así que pasa a saludar a tus nuevos vecinos en el zoológico de Los Ángeles. Trae al abuelo, encontrará compañero de caminata también. Han ampliado, hay mucho más que ver y hacer. Ni te imaginas a quién te encontrarás aquí. Te esperan las aves, ay, qué exóticas. Hagas lo que hagas, llega temprano con mamá y papá. Aquí te espera la gran diversión con tus buenos vecinos del zoológico de Los Ángeles. Need a recycling center? Call 311, the toll-free number for non-emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Illegally parked cars? 
Call 311, the toll-free number for non-emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Hi, I'm Zadie. Welcome to the Pacific Palisades, and you're watching Channel 35. It's our city and our channel.
Good morning. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, October 23rd. I'd like to welcome you to your Los Angeles City Council meeting. My name is Herb Wesson, and I will be today's presiding officer. Madam Clerk, I do believe we have a quorum. Could you please call the roll? Alicone, Buscaino, Cardenas, Englander, Garcetti, Wezar, Koreska, Coyne, LaBange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosenthal, Zine, Wesson. Ten members present and a quorum, Mr. President. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Coretz moves, LaBange seconds. Next. Committee resolutions for approval. Englander moves, Zine seconds. Mr. President, today is Tuesday and now would be the time for the flag salute. Could I please ask everybody in council chambers to rise for our flag salute to... Today, we will be led by Paul Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. President. If you'll all please uh, join me in facing the flag of our great country and recite the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. And somebody out there in the audience was really fast. They, that was a fast pledge they did. So at this time, Madam Clerk, before we start with our, we have a very important presentation. Let's run through the agenda. If we could go through the uh, first section, please. Item one, our liens, notes for public hearing. The Department of Building and Safety reports that the lien amount for item 1L should be reduced to $4,560.51 due to the receipt of partial payments. Also, items 1A, E, and H may be received and filed and as much as the liens have been paid. Okay, without objection. Do we have any cards? Cards on item 1J. Okay. Let's uh, vote on members. Any, Mr. Reyes? Oh, no, it was Mr. Alicorn. I'd like to continue 1K. 1K? Continued until? For 45 days. For? 45 days. 45 days. So let's give the clerk a minute to figure out what exact date that is. November 7th. Okay, then without objection. Sorry, December 5th, sorry. Do we have any, any, uh, Items left to vote on? Yes, Mr. President. Okay, then let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Next section. Items two through 18 are items for which public hearings have been held. Specials uh, members, Mr. Koretz. I'd like to call item four special. Item four for Mr. Koretz. Okay, seeing and hearing no more requests, let us uh, prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, I know we have some ordinances, and we'll just re-vote on those, Madam Clerk, when we have 12 members. Okay. Okay, could you uh, take us through the next section? Items 19 through 24 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes required for consideration. Okay, without objection, those items are now before us. Do we have cards? No cards. Okay, members, specials. Okay, then on these items, uh, you feeling frisky today, Mr. Koretz? Uh, item 22 for Mr. Garcetti. Okay, item 22 from Mr. Caret. I mean, via Mr. Caret for Eric Garcetti. Let's uh, prepare Madam Clerk to vote on the remaining items. Let us open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. All right, uh, next section of items. On the supplemental agenda, items 25 through 27 are items for which public hearings have been held. Mr. Zine. 27 special. 27 special for Mr. Zine. Any other specials? Let's uh, prepare to vote. Let us open the... Uh, Excuse me, Mr. President. I think, uh, relax, Mr. City Attorney. We, we got time. Be held on 
Okay, then we'll hold item 26. And there's so, cards on item 25, Mr. President. Okay, and we'll hold 25 due to cards. Let us open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. Okay, next. Item 28 is a closed session item. Do you wish to hold this on the desk? Uh, let me defer to Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. I think uh, it's appropriate that we consider item 28 in closed session, so if you could hold so that. So we'll hold uh, 20, 28 as well. Um, yes. And uh, Madam Clerk, I think we'll just at this point bypass item 29 because we don't have 12 members yet. We've just been joined by Bill Rosendahl. Please give Bill Rosendahl a round of applause. And Mr. Parks. Okay, uh, with that said, we've run through the agenda. Mr. Krikorian, would you, are you ready for your presentation? Oh, Mr. Garcetti. Then why don't we do this, Madam Clerk, at this time, I'm going to ask that... Um, we vote for reconsideration on item 14, and then quickly we'll vote on it again. So I'm asking that we, this is a vote for reconsideration. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, now we're going to vote on item 14. Let us uh, open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes, two noes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Garcetti, would you like to begin? Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Mr. Krikorian and I would like to join together today. Um, I'd like to pass it over first to Mr. Krikorian to say a few introductory remarks uh, to celebrate Armenian Heritage Month. I want to thank Christine Jarin and my staff and uh, others who have worked very hard uh, with Mr. Krikorian's staff to make this historic day. But let's turn it over to our first Armenian American council member in the history of this city, the one, the only, and I think he claims to have two more Armenians living in his district than in mine. It's very close, neck and neck, but please give a warm round of applause to Paul Krikorian. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you for that, that welcome, Mr. Garcetti. But uh, I do first want to thank Mr. Garcetti for uh, developing the idea and bringing forward a uh, commemoration of Armenian heritage today. Uh, of course, the Armenian culture uh, goes back 3,000 years, and in this country for more than a century, uh, Armenian Americans have contributed greatly to the diverse fabric of our society, and through their contributions of, of their culture and heritage, uh, have enriched all of us. And so today we'll be honoring um, but a few representative examples of the great cultural contribution that the Armenian Americans of Los Angeles have made to uh, um, the diverse fabric of our society, and uh, we're going to begin with a few introductions and a few other comments by Mr. Garcetti, uh, and, uh, and then we have a special surprise uh, at the conclusion of this, uh, which uh, is the recognition of a group of people that have made uh, all of America very, very proud with, a, um, with an achievement that the entire globe has been watching. So uh, let me turn it first to Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. I'm very proud to stand with you today to stand with the Armenian community as well to celebrate Armenian Heritage Month here in Los Angeles. Um, we're very lucky in Council District 13 to have Little Armenia, uh, which was the first so designated neighborhood that my uh, predecessor, Jackie Goldberg, helped to create um, in the world. 
It was the very first one uh, anywhere. And we are a stronger city for it. We are proud of the tremendous contributions that are made by the Armenian uh, residents that are here in Los Angeles. It was in 406 AD that uh, Mesrop uh, Mastov invented the written Armenian language. And with the written word, the golden age of Armenian literature was born. Throughout the centuries, Armenians have left a legacy of literature, music, art, science, architecture, and more. For anybody who ever visited Armenia, I remember coming back and giving a presentation. Uh, when you go in Armenia, no matter what it is, you're standing on a carpet, they said, that comes from the word carpeta, it was invented here. Or you're eating something and it, you know, grain first came from here. The oldest wine was recently discovered, I think, by a UCLA um, uh, archaeologist in Armenia. So I got a bottle, it's not that great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after, after 3,000 years, it doesn't quite yeah, taste as, as great, but it really is incredible, the contributions that a small but mighty nation has given not only to the world, but to our country. Um, throughout the centuries, Armenians have left a legacy of literature, music, art, science, architecture, and more. And 2012 has been a particularly celebratory year as Armenia celebrates 500 years of printing. UNESCO selected our sister city, Yerevan, Armenia, as this year's world book capital. And Yerevan just celebrated, as we celebrate our what number, Mr. Labange, this year? 231st. They were celebrating their 2,794th birthday in Yerevan. So this... And... Uh, and as Mr. Laban said, you still look so young. The same spirit and tradition of contribution to our society by the Armenian people continues right here in Los Angeles. And today we honor Armenian Americans who are making their mark in the arts, science, and businesses. Six individuals and then a surprise at the end. I'm going to do the first three. So first I'd like to ask Kavork uh, Parsigan to come forward and to celebrate Parsigan Records, which was established in Hollywood, California, and today is the oldest operating small business in Little Armenia. Come over here, come over. Parsigan produced and distributed Armenian music and film to Armenians throughout the country and the world. Kevork Parsigian and Parsigian Records have been an anchor for film and music for countless Armenians throughout the diaspora. And on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, we present this certificate of commendation to Parsigian Records. May you continue to honor and uplift the spirit of the Armenian people and our city of Los Angeles. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we want to make sure we can see your face. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Great. Next, we have the ARPA Foundation for Film, Music, and Art. Thank you, Kavork, very much. I'd like to ask uh, Sylvia Manessian to come forward, who established AFMA to support filmmakers whose work explores the issues of diaspora. Exile, come on forward. <laughs> diaspora, exile, and multiculturalism. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. In 1997, AFMA produced the ARPA International Film Festival in Hollywood. And I'm proud to say that this year marks the festival's 15th anniversary. It's incredible. And earlier this year, Sylvia Manessian was recognized for her outstanding contributions to Armenian cinematic arts with the gold medal of the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Armenia, one of the highest Armenian cultural awards. And I know Mr. Kokorian, who has worked a long time with the Armenian film community, uh, is very proud to co-present with me today to the foundation. This also certificate of commendation um, to the ARPA Foundation for Music and Arts, AFMA. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Much. We'll have time for folks who want to mingle with and talk in the back as well, and we want to be respectful of the council's time. So my last one before handing it over to uh, our great council member, Mr. Krikorian, is Karun Darius. And I'd like to ask uh, Antranik Bagdasarian to come forward as well. Now, Antranik Bagdasarian, in 1990, began selling... Nice to see you. How are you? Began selling um, and making authentic handmade cheese and selling to local ethnic stores out of a small storefront in Hollywood. Two years later, Karun Darius was born. Now I want to say, not only does he make some of the best Armenian cheese in the world, but he makes some of the best Mexican cheese in the world as Thank well. You. And Karun, which means uh, spring, I believe, in Armenian, um, is just that, a spring of prosperity, of tasty cheese, and a place that has become an icon to the mainstream market, not only preserving the Armenian tradition of handmade cheeses, 
but, and yogurts, but also producing a wide array of award-winning dairy products. Through its production of premium custom cheese, yogurt, and other dairy products, people throughout the world are able to embrace the spirit and the legacy of the Bagdasarian family. So with that, I'd like to give you this certificate of commendation and thank you for your great contribution. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, honor. Thank you. Say cheese. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Kirkorian. Well, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Uh, in 1989, Maestro Vace Barsumian brought together a group of Armenian-American musicians, teachers, and community leaders who were committed to creating a high-caliber artistic program dedicated to the beauty of the Armenian heritage, history, and culture, and to the preservation of Armenian contributions to, to music. Together, they created the Lark Musical Society to preserve that culture by ensuring that Armenian music is studied, researched, created, published and magnificently performed. Uh, over the course of the last two decades, the Lark Musical Society uh, has created a research facility, a conservatory educating hundreds of students. Today they've produced over 300 concerts and through their preservation efforts, countless future generations of Armenians will have the opportunity, Armenians and non-Armenians will have the opportunity to embrace Armenian music and the arts. Your continued edu their continued education of students in musical studies uh, will leave a lasting impact and a legacy uh, to all of us here in Los Angeles and abroad. And uh, today the Los Angeles City Council is proud to honor the Lark Musical Society for its contributions to Armenian music and the arts and the cultural environment of the city of Los Angeles. Maestro Barsumi. Our next honoree, Vahik Pirhamzai, has established himself as a multilingual playwright, an actor, and a director. There isn't enough time during this brief presentation to list all of his accomplishments, but today we're here to celebrate the success of his film, My Uncle Raphael, based on a character that he wrote and brought to life on stage for the Armenian community. My Uncle Raphael marks Vahik's crossover success from Armenian theater to mainstream American film with the, the adaptation of a character originally written and performed on stage and in Armenian. My Uncle Raphael, which opened in several major cities, uh, it, it was directed by Mark Fusco, who was quoted as saying, it's exciting bringing a character from a wildly successful stage play to the big screen, especially such a universal character as, as Uncle Raphael. As a country of immigrants, we've all known or met an Uncle Raphael in our lives and probably even learned from him. In this case, he just happens to be Armenian. <laughs> Um, through his work in theater and film, uh, countless future generations uh, will have the opportunity to uh, learn more about uh, the Armenian-American heritage and culture. And so today, the Los Angeles City Council is proud to honor Vahik Perhamzai for his contribution to Armenian theater, film, and the arts, and to the Los Angeles cultural environment. Thank you. Thank you. This is great to have you here. Okay. So don't forget, Uncle Raphael in theaters here in Los Angeles. Is <laughs> okay. Uh, our next honoree is Krikor Satamian, who is a renowned actor, entertainer, comedian, and director. Baron Satamian has been a force in the Armenian theatrical community for over 50 years. 
His legacy is felt throughout the nation. He's founded several theater companies in Boston, Detroit, New York, Philadelphia, and right here in Los Angeles through his work with the Armenian General Benevolent Union, uh, the largest Armenian philanthropic organization in the world. Since his arrival in Los Angeles in 1988 as the artistic director of the AGBU Ardavast Theater Company, he has directed 75 plays, three operettas, and acted in 85 plays. His contributions to the Armenian community was marked this year by the launching by the Armenian General Benevol Benevolent Union of the AGBU Krikor Satamian Theater Company in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, Baron Satamian has left a tremendous legacy to all of us uh, through his wor work and dedication to the arts, and we're very, very proud to be able to present to him the certificate of commendation. Baron Satamian. So our last, uh, Mr. President, surprise here is we have on August 6th this summer in 2012, the Mars rover Curiosity landed on Mars to investigate the Martian climate and geology. The Armenian Americans who worked on this project were a significant part of the Mars rover Curiosity team. They've been a source of pride for the Armenian community, and it's our pleasure to honor them here today. It is an incredibly long list, which tells you just how amazing the Armenian community has been in contributing. So we're, I think we'll, we'll say all the names. We, we will. Okay. Um, but I'm going to let Mr. Kokorian say a couple things. These individuals played an integral role in making history and making us all proud as Americans, but the group of Armenian Americans was particularly notable. Mr. Kokorian. Well, I just wanted to, to note that um, Mr. Garcetti often talks about the pobladores who came and founded Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I think when we look at our nation's history, um, it's important to note that when Jamestown was founded, one of the first uh, establishments of European establishments here in North America. One of the, one of the founders of Jamestown uh, was a person known as Martin the Armenian, a uh, tobacco salesman, the first Armenian to arrive on these shores uh, in the year 1620. And so uh, just as Martin the Armenian explored uh, distant lands and went off into the unknown uh, to establish a presence in a, in a new place, uh, the 21st century version of that uh, is the work of these uh, folks that we're about to introduce who've allowed all of us, all of humanity, to reach uh, a distant planet and uh, embrace it and, and to be able to touch and feel it through, uh, the, work, uh, of, uh, through the work that they've done through the JPL. So I'm um, very pleased to welcome all of them here. And uh, we're going to go through uh, the names yeah. on, on this list. Yes. OK. Uh, so I guess is the names on this list are these. Let's go, th let's go okay. through it in the order of the right. certificates. Uh, we'll so the, 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 first, uh, is, the first honoree is Richard Ohanyan. We'll do a group picture at the end. So. Okay, our, se our second one is Garen Kanoyan. Gayane Kazarian. Thank you for your great work. To the left. Okay. Alfred Kashaki. Henry Hartunian. Armin Turian. Sergik Zadurian. Asha Luis Shamilian. Okay. 
Zare Gorjan. And Felix Sarkisian. And um, with that, the Los Angeles City Council commends you for your contributions to the Mars, Mars Science Laboratory Project. It's incredible to see the hard work and dedication that you gave not only to this country, but to this world and to the solar system. Um, maybe it was, what was the name of the first? Martin. Martin, Armenian. Martin it's, maybe it's Martian now, <laughs> the, Ar the Armenians who are going to be helping uh, to settle a new planet and to make sure that our, our wisdom expands. But let us all give a round of applause. I'd like to give it back to Mr. Kokorian no, for the we're closing. We're done? Okay. For all the contributions of Armenian Americans and have a happy Armenian American History Month in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kokorian. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. And thank all our guests. And we're all going to take a picture together in the top. So come on. Okay, um, we're going to go to item 25. Madam Clerk, item 25 was held special by cards. Dr. Tom Williams and John Walsh. Mr. Englander. Yes, forthwith on 15, 16, and 17, please. Without objection. Yes, Mr. Park. Yeah, I'd just like to be shown as a no vote on 14. We're, I'm going to go back to okay. that, so I, I got you, but we're going to wait a second and we'll go back to that. Okay, uh, Mr. Dr. Tom Williams, followed by John Walsh. Dr. Tom Williams, LA 32 Neighborhood Council Land Use Chairperson. Also, we're quite interested in transportation. Loss of $2.5 million out of transportation over to the general fund. Without any sort of consultation with the affected neighborhood councils, without any community impact statement, this is consistent with LADOT's uh, rather submissive, but we're trying to figure out what they got for it. So we're quite confused. Uh, we need to have this reheard and reheard from the neighborhood councils and done. So let's cooperate at the department level. I reserve one minute. Thank you. John Walsh? No, come on, no comments from the audience. Mr. John Walsh. I do not see Mr. Walsh. So let's prepare to vote on this item. Let us open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 eyes. Forthwith on that. Now we're going to go to item one. And I have uh, cards on item one. I have John Walsh again. And uh, I believe Aaron Kadash. Aaron Kadash. Please come forward. This is on item one. Yes, sir. 
Well, I am <coughs> I'm here because I received the letter that uh, I owe 12,000 and, uh, and some hundreds of dollars, and uh, I don't even know why I owe this money. If we can get our department spokesman to come forward. <coughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, morning, Council. My name is Charles Kalibala. I'm here to represent the Department of Building and Safety uh, on case of item uh, 1J. Uh, the, the property owner, uh, Mr. Kadash, has been sent invoices. Uh, first of all, Mr. Kadash has, is a, has a, a property that has um, uh, multiple auto-related businesses and the department has been issuing invoices to his tenants for inspections performed at the property, but the tenants have failed to pay. And in, in, these invoices go all the way back to 1993, and the department is therefore proposing that a lien be placed on this property for an amount of $12,898.34. This amount breaks down as follows. Annual inspection fees are $5,998.36. System development surcharge came to $286.20. Non-compliance code enforcement fee is $1,650. Late charge collection fees are $4,125. Accumulated interest $785 and title report fee of $53. That comes to $12,898. And again, the department is proposing that, that this lien be placed on property address 801 West Rosecrans Avenue, which is owned by Mr. Kadash and his family for failure to pay inspection invoices to the Department of Building and Safety. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I believe that he referred to invoices that uh, they invoice my uh, tenants. You see, I rent uh, spaces to uh, automotive people that uh, deal with repairing cars, and uh, the turnover of the tenants in this property is absolutely huge. And every time I received invoices, I represented to the tenants, and that's uh, what I could have done. I mean, I pay my taxes to uh, the property taxes on time, I uh, pay all my taxes. Okay, okay, I, Mr. Kadash. Who, who's, what, what's the address? 801 through 8, uh, 801, 805, and 809 West Roscrans Avenue in Gardena. Council District 15. Okay, so that's Mr. Buscaino? Yeah. Yes, yeah, CD 15, Mr. Buscaino. I talked to, to his representative earlier today. And uh, again, the property owner of 801 West Rosecrans Avenue is 801, 805, and 809 West Rosecrans have completely failed to pay their inspection invoices okay. so the, for the past the, so many years. So the council office wants us to move forward with this? Is this what you're telling me? Yeah, I want to move forward and place a, confirm the lien on this property so we can okay. get the Okay, thank you. Mr. The Mr. Walsh now, please come forward. Uh, Mr. Kadash will vote on this item when we hear from Mr. John Walsh. I'm done. No, you're 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 done for right now. Stand here if you want. Okay. John Walsh, HollywoodHighlands.org for identification purposes only. No, on Measure J and anybody but Garcetti for Mayor Committee. We support these two men. We support their position. Thank you. Okay. Now, seeing and hearing no concerns from uh, cons Council District uh, 15. Yes, Mr. President, we're going to uh, move forward on this with okay. the recommendation from that's, staff. That's Thank all you. I need. Thank you. Sir. So, members, uh, on this item, let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Okay, now, Madam Clerk, I want to take up, we have more than 12 members. I want to take up items 3 and 5, so let's vote to reconsider items 3 and 5. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, 
tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Okay, now we will re-vote on those items. Let's, this is actually on the item. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Okay. All right, now I'd like to move to item 22. And that was called special by Mr. Garci um, Garcetti. Okay, it's my understanding, based on conversations with his office, that he's prepared to move forward on this item. So on item 22, let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. And we already satisfied the public comment. We're related to that item, right, Madam Clerk? Uh, no, Mr. President, if there are cards, um, council should hear the cards. Okay, so then I guess we will now vote to reconsider. Yes. I didn't hear you. Item five forthwith, please. Four. Item five forthwith. Thank you. Items uh, five, four, item five, forthwith. Okay, on item 22, this is for reconsideration. It's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Mr. Walsh. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Look at our endorsements. Uh, for identification purposes only, I am uh, chairman of United Rail Riders of Los Angeles, and we are 100% against Measure J. Uh, as far as this item is concerned, I agree. This, uh, the uh, Northeast Police Station has uh, met the CEQA requirements. And even though I am a member of anybody but Garcetti for mayor, in his last few months he's doing a good job when it comes to CEQA investigations of LAPD. Those are the only good investigations he does of the LAPD. Thank you. HollywoodHighlands.org. Okay, now let's vote on this item. Let's uh, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Fifteen ayes. Mr. Koretz, are you ready yet on item four? Okay, Mr. Koretz will take item four. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have one quick question for staff, if we have staff here to answer it. Could we please uh, get, please come forward. And just one quick general question about Transmission planning organizations like West Connect. Um, the city of Los Angeles is committed to get off coal power. And I'm wondering whether West Connect actively advocates for or against any types of power that may be used. Um, in other words, do we know whether or not they actually may advocate for a position that's against the uh, city of Los Angeles policy on, on transmission issues? Honorable Council. No sound. Honorable Council, this is uh, Mukles Buyan with uh, Manager of uh, Transmission uh, Planning and Studies at Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. This uh, sub-regional organization, West Connect, is a uh, transmission planning sub-regional organization, and they do not advocate any sort of uh, a generation uh, source of fuel, whether coal or other other uh, source of fuels. It is just a transmission planning organization, sub regional entity. Okay, so we're we're confident they won't be advocating against positions that we are taking Absolutely. on those issues. Absolutely. Thank you. That's my only question. Thank thank you thank you guys and uh, thank you uh, for your concern, Mr. Koretz. On this item, let's prepare to vote. Let us open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Okay, now we're going to move to item 26. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, John Hung, 
and John Walsh. Dr. Tom Williams, LA32 Neighborhood Council. On this one, we, we, we support the 245 action, but we also are quite concerned regarding the inclusion of neighborhood council participation in the planning period. I am a land use chairperson, but we don't get notifications or a notification source on the web page uh, for finding out what's happening in a timely fashion. Three days is not a timely fashion for real consideration and meaningful contribution to this process. We support the 245, but we're quite concerned that the 245 action include the neighborhood councils in the relevant areas. Thank you. Reserve one minute. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, John. And now we'll go to John, uh, John Walsh, HollywoodHighland.org. I'm still looking for a John Chong or, or, or John Hong. Mr. Walsh. John Walsh, for identification purposes only, Special Agent 007 Barack Obama. So you want to present me as some sort of right-wing crazy when I am an anti-racist. HollywoodHighlands.org, we support 245. Uh, HollywoodHighlands.org, I said, and no on J, and anybody but Garcetti for mayor. We support the motion, and we agree with Mr. Williams. HollywoodHighlands.org, Barack Obama for president. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. I thought I saw Mr. Chung. Yes, sir, please come forward. Do you want to wear my jacket? We'll switch jackets. Hello, my name is John Chang. Uh, um, I'm really sorry for mispronouncing your name. No problem. John Chang, and I thank you, uh, Chairman Huizar, for giving me the opportunity to move this forward for further review. Uh, it has been an honor for me to live in the Eagle Rock community for over 35 years, and with your help, I can continue to uh, be a contributing member to the Northeast area. Um, my family has lived on the property for close to 30 years, and I hope to continue the long-standing tradition with my growing family. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wezar. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I ask for your I vote on this. I don't usually take the extraordinary step to request that the Council assert jurisdiction over an area planning commission decision. However, I've been following Mr. Chang's attempts to split the lot at his family home for some time, and I feel this is perhaps one instance where some decision-maker discretion may be warranted due to the unique arrangement and topography of this lot and its surrounding neighbors. Mr. Chang is not a speculative developer. He is a local business owner who lives in his, with his family at this home in Eagle Rock with a growing family of his own. He hopes to subdivide the oversized, irregular property to build a home and back for his young family while his parents live in the front house where they now share. Mr. Chang's request is supported by his neighbors, the Eagle Rock Association, and the property is situated in unique topography with the irregular lot cuts throughout the neighborhood. Mr. Chang's request would not include any nuisance or impacts on his neighbors. Therefore, I ask my fellow council members to join me in supporting this motion. I would like to amend my motion to take jurisdiction and refer this item to Plum. I think at Plum we will get uh, additional information that may or may not warrant a different direction as the Area Planning Commission, but some information was brought to our attention that we think may warrant additional hearings, and we could do that at Plum and come back with the same decision or a different decision. Ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman. I appreciate that. No other speakers on the queue. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Fifteen eyes. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, next item, number 27. Is that right, Mr. Zion? Yes, item 27, called special by Mr. Zion. Called special by Mr. Zion, item 27. Answered. Question's been answered. Send it through. Question has been answered. So no other speakers on the queue. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. The uh, next item will be uh, general public comment. Jose, Macias, Dollhouse Dude, Sean. Is that you, Sean Murphy? Mm -hmm. Line up. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. Hi, my name is Jose Macias. I'm currently here because I'm trying to get some sort of assistance from the commission or from um, LAPD or anybody. Um, I currently live at 10616 South Central Avenue, 
And a while back ago, I was living at 4010 South of Dare Street, and I gave some information to a police officer that led to some uh, drug busts and some drug labs in South Central, also to some murders. Uh, what happened then after that is that I know that some individuals in around my area or maybe around the city of L.A. know what I've done. So I don't know if my life pretty much runs in danger, but I have been approached by certain people that call me a cop or call me an informant. Uh, I currently live with my mom and I live with my brother. I don't know if their life might run also in risk, but see, wherever I go, even where I work, people actually point me or actually whistle or try to tell me that I'm a snitch. Whether or not my race thinks that it's not correct for me to actually go ahead and take the proper measures legally to fight back against criminals or somebody who is trying to hurt me for what I've done, it's just, you know, that I had to come here and make it public so that I can actually let you guys know that there's somebody out there trying to intimidate me and trying to actually have me removed illegally from the country because that's what they will do. They will try to attack me because they know that I have a permanent residential alien card and then they will attack me and try to actually have me removed from the country for committing a crime. That's why I came here to get uh, help from Mr. Parks because I knew Mr. Parks' grandmother personally. She used to live right next door to me and I know his mom also. So that's why I came to make this statement public so that I can seek the help from chambers and from people who are willing to help me take my life back and also try to stay on the path of living a better life than the life that I lived, you know. So thank you very much and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're 106. Thank you very much. Sean Murphy. Yes, good morning, Mr. President. Uh, vote no on Measure J. It's not a good idea. And shame on the MTA for stalling the Expo line. Let's just get it going. Dollhouse dude. Uh, can I have his extra time? I have a lot to say. Anyway, uh, uh, let me see, where can I begin? Uh, Corets, Wizard, Garcetti, Englander, Cardenas, Buscaino, Alarcón, City Attorney, City Clerk, Voting Clerk, Rosenthal, Reyes, Perry, Parks, Labonge, Cricorian, are you paying attention? I don't think so. Anyway, uh, have you read my book? No. The people are telling you we need housing more than anything. And why are we stupid enough to not create a system with no red tape where everybody can have a home and no landlord? Hey, Alarcón, you are my main supporter since you're no longer in politics, right? Uh, politicians, put your thinking caps on. You need a big sombrero. We need a lot more Mexican Armenians to celebrate this Armenian Day. We need to mingle around the world so we are not so territorial and we provide a house for every single human being in the world and we stop calling each other names like you Armenian, you Mexican, you Korean, you yellow, you white, you black, you stupid. Anyway, we're also stupid that I don't know where we're going to start a real program that will help human beings and not just the city to collect money from parking meters, from uh, phony tickets, etc., etc. I am not here to complain. I'm here to explain, you idiots. So what we're going to have right now, if you could hold, I did not call your name yet, sir, hold on a second, Mr. Reyes for a very, very special introduction. Thank you, Council President. Uh, colleagues, I'd like to acknowledge our guests, the representatives from the new governor of Yucatan, Mexico. We have with us, Se puede por favor, Ingeniera Elizabeth Gamboa Solis, Directora Instituto para el Desarrollo de Cultura Maya, Yucatan. Uh, Angel Vasto Blanco, who is the jefe del Departamento de Proyectos Estratégicos, también del Instituto. We have with us Roger David Alcocer Garcia, Mayor of Valladolid, Yucatan, Mexico. And Professor Marcos Antonio Vela Reyes, 
diputado federal distrito 5 no está aquí en Yucatán a Jorge Tolosa Pú y también a Rita Narayes bienvenidos and thank you very much and again these are guests from Yucatán, México muchas gracias Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes, a very special guest. Now uh, I'm going to call up Mr. Evans, followed by Dr. Williams and John Walsh. If Mr. Los Angeles had another name, it would be Tom Labonge, the most knowledgeable person of the city of Los Angeles history. Mr. Labonge, I'm deeply concerned about a number of the food service programs that serve our citizens in Los Angeles. I'm deeply concerned that every action must be taken possible to preserve Meals on Wheels. We need to provide Meals on Wheels not only to our seniors, but to our disabled and to our veterans. It's my personal hope through the outstanding management and leadership that you bring to our city and a commitment to ensuring that all of our citizens do well, that we put an end to homelessness that you will attend to the public leadership policies that are necessary to ensure our city thrive and grow. I invite all of you to visit my website, MervinEvans.com. As a son of Los Angeles, I'm deeply committed to ensuring Los Angeles does well and continue to grow in the future. If you're an absentee voter, you need to have already voted. Merv Evans, please encourage all our citizens to take advantage of their democratic responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Walsh, followed by Dr. Williams. You do a good job, of Mr. LeBond, running this meeting compared to Garcetti. HollywoodHighlands.org, no on J. They predicted by the year 2000 the red line would have 300,000 boardings. Twelve years after that prediction, the red line has 150,000 boardings. Hardly anybody uses it except poor people who are trying to buy a car. Anybody, incidentally, later today, we will announce a major person in L.A., a millionaire business owner who is, whose name everybody in this room knows will be running for mayor. Watch. We will send out an email blast. This is a bombshell. Brenda Carter, an African-American woman in a wheelchair, was brutally killed by a malfunctioning escalator on last Tuesday. The MTA, including that garbage up here, Mr. Huizar, kept it quiet for two days until Mike Antonovich blew the whistle. One billion dollars in deferred maintenance is the reason she died on the escalator. She couldn't take the elevator because that was broken too. One, this has been appeared in the LA Times, one billion worth of B dollars in deferred, and you want to build a rail system so that the wealthy white people in the West Side can have their black and brown uh, servants get out there more easily so they don't have to drive them. I'm telling you now, the latest poll, you'll see, go to the LA uh, blog now, go to Romero's blog, shows Wendy Gruel, 30%, Eric, 15%. Eric Garcetti's campaign is falling apart. He's not there, and his, his campaign consultant, when he was asked about it, used the F word to the L.A. Weekly. If I said it now, you'd throw me out. Anybody but Thank Garcetti. you very much. That's a fine guy, Eric Garcetti. Fine guy. That's the word he probably used. Dr. Tom Williams. Dr. Tom Williams, L.A. 32 Neighborhood Council. Two rather disturbing subjects. One, have you ever been to a place called Aleppo? I was there for over a year. Had some very nice people. Went through the Muslim Brotherhood rebellion against the Assad regime. But that was Hafez Assad. Oh, by the way, he was known as the Butcher of Hama, where they used tanks heavy artillery, helicopter, gunships. They're doing it again. And oh, by the way, there were, a, there were a lot of Armenians in Halab, Aleppo. 
I don't know who's left now. I know that some of that my friends are dead, and many of them are probably injured. So what happened to a proposed resolution for supporting the people of Halab, Aleppo, and Syria? So second issue. Mr. Rosenthal is going through a very trying time. I was there with my son. Bone marrow donors are needed. They need to be available on a registry, and the city of Los Angeles has one of the largest employee bases that they should be encouraged to become bone marrow donors. You don't have to donate because until it's needed, but it's better than saving cats and dogs because it can save a lot of people. The problem in LA is we have such a wide and beautiful diversity, but that also means that we need a lot more bone marrow donors on the registry. Thank you. Doug Hain. Followed by John Wayner of Sun Valley. Good morning. My name is Doug Haynes. I'm with East Hollywood Neighborhood Council. There's a lot of theater in this council, but I hope you take seriously what I'm about to tell you. Tomorrow, the city council will vote on whether or not to approve an MND for a mixed-use development located immediately adjacent to Kingsley Elementary School and restricted density housing in Little Armenia. That would be the tallest building on Santa Monica Boulevard for two, year, two miles. Over 300 petition signatures were submitted against this massive development and is strongly opposed by our neighborhood council, the Hollywood Design Review Committee, and the parents and teachers of the 536 children at Kingsley Elementary School. Since this is a consent item on Wednesday's agenda, we will probably not be allowed to speak, and you will probably be unaware of the concerns that we have. This development demands an environmental impact report. The project site formerly housed several auto repair and paint operations over a period of decades, and the soil that will blow across the play field of Kingsley Elementary School during excavation and construction contains dramatically increased lead levels. The developers lobbyists dismiss such concerns as irrelevant, but that's exactly what they're paid to say. If you vote tomorrow to approve this development, please consider who's going to take responsibility for the children who suffer cognitive disabilities from ingesting lead that leached into this soil. Which one of you is going to take responsibility for the children who experience diminished lung capacity and lifelong asthma attacks due to inhaling the diesel exhaust and rogue dust particulates from this development that would be set back only eight feet from the school's play field? And which one of you is going to tell the parents of those children that their lives weren't important enough for you to require that this massive project undergo an EIR? Please consider that tomorrow and think about the kids who may suffer from this. Thank you very much. John. Council members, thank you for allowing me to update you on the corruption in the Department of General Services and the Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks. You have a letter in front of you that was given this morning for details. My name is John Warner. I'm president of Canon Sports Inc., a company that supplies sporting good equipment to schools and publicly funded institutions throughout the United States. We served the city of L.A. for 27 years. The last contract provided us was four years with six one-year extensions. They expired two years ago. Department of General Services and L.A. Park and Rec failed to issue a new contract creating much expense and confusion in the city. It took them six more months to prepare a bid for the same products. The bid was line item and catalog discount, and the first one was uh, opening was December 16, 2011. At that time, we won all the line items. They were supposed to issue the contract and the uh, purchase orders the first week of January. Uh, it took them four months to send us to an award letter saying that we only got the line items, not the... Uh, the bid for the catalog. We protested. We went down and found out they put all the wrong prices in for ours. We corrected everything and afterward they said, oh, we must not have done something right. Uh, we're going to cancel this. They did another bid. They structured this bid for an out-of-state company, BSN, who's owned by a Canadian firm. So all tax revenues, inventory tax, employees, everything that's spent, all those revenues will go to Texas if these guys have the bid. Okay. Again, we did this, they restructured it to favor them with their products. 
we won that bid again, both the catalog and line items. And then we got a call from them and said, we're canceling the, this and we're not telling you why. And we submitted samples at their request and everything. The last thing is there's a third bid right now and they have hired a Chicago firm that's going to cost the city $400,000 to monitor this bid in a reverse auction. It's corruption at the highest. Thank you very much. Your comment that concludes public comment. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, Madam City Clerk, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I'd like to have a five-minute recess. As you know, it was an opportunity uh, during the year uh, when all members are present for the archivals to take a picture. So I ask all members, five-minute recess, and uh, we'll stroll to the center table. Thank you very much. Ms. Perry? No, I just wanted to see whether we're going to do the reconsideration 14 or I can just be shown as a no vote. Okay. After the photo. Thank you very much. Okay, so members will gather for the photo at this time. Follow Betsy and Sherry for direction.
Okay, members, we're now back in session. A request has been made that uh, we suspend the rules to reconsider item 14. In order to do that, a motion needs to be made, and I will make that motion, and I do need a second. Okay, Mr. LeBange seconds. So with that, Madam Clerk, on item 14, the vote is for reconsideration. Let us open, suspend the rules. The, the vote is, let's prepare for the vote. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. So now we vote to reconsider. Now we vote for reconsideration. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes, 2 noes. Okay, so now, Mr. Reyes, what we have to do is to actually vote again on item 14. So now we're going to do that. Madam Clerk, prepare to vote. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes, four noes. Okay. That's adopted. We can now move to item 29. Uh, Mr. President, do you wish to uh, recess the regular and uh, begin the special meeting? At this juncture, we will recess the regular, go into the special. And... Uh, Mr. Reyes, how would you like to, would you like to Excuse open me, up? Mr. President, yes. um, first we need to call the roll for the special meeting. Call Alec the Cron, roll. Blue Scaino, Cardenas, Englander, Garcetti, Vizar, Caress, Cacorin, LaBange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Zion, Wesson, 14 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. How would you like to proceed, Mr. Reyes? If we can, um, if we can open the uh, floor for discussion. Okay, I have a ton of cards. I'm going to do one minute per card. I, Amy Koo, I think it is. In fact, let me ask uh, Mr. Garcetti, would you come up here? I think I'm going to need some assistance. Amy Koo, I believe. Shayman Lee. Shayman Lee. Safet Fay, I got that. <laughs> Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Amy Koo, and I'm an attorney at the law firm of Schwartz, Stein, Sapir, Dorman, and Somers. The city should adopt the revised findings of the Plump Committee and approve the proposed ICO. The Plum Committee's revised findings were correct and on point. The ICO is consistent with Government Code 65858. Large formula retail poses an immediate threat to the public health, safety, and welfare of the people of Chinatown. Small businesses have been a key to the economic survival of immigrant communities such as Chinatown. Studies have shown that the presence of large formula retail stores will take revenue out of the local community while decimating the livelihood of existing local small business owners who simply cannot compete on the same scale. The potential proliferation of formula retail threatens to destroy the unique character of this culturally significant neighborhood and further raises traffic and safety concerns. ICOs are meant to be intermeasures to prevent irreversible and incompatible development. Thank you. Thank you. Do I get two minutes? No. I, I said one minute. Um, so next. Hi, good morning to the council members. My name is Sharon. I'm part of CCED. In the past few months, I did a lot of business outreach. Uh, in Chinatown, and I got more than 100 petition letters from the business owner in Chinatown. Here, I'm going to read out a statement by small business in Chinatown who are here in support of the ordinance protecting Chinatown in spirit, but unfortunately could not be here because they are attending to the store. 
We are a coalition of small business united in preserving our Chinatown. We represent business from the grocery, pharmacy, food and retail store that have been operating in Chinatown, ranging from the last 50 years to the present. All of us share a deep commitment to serving the community in and staying a part of the fabric of Chinatown until we can pass our business down to our family members. We are against a chain retailer like Walmart coming into our neighborhood because it fattens our very livelihood business and would change our community dramatically. We ask that our city council member please fight for our behalf and vote yes on ICO. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. And after you, sir, we have Alice and Judy Erickson. Go right ahead. Hi. My name is Sopa. I live in Chinatown and I'm part of a CCD and Sika. I'm in support of the ICO. Traffic's been bad, especially when there's a Dodger game going on. Having a big retail store such as Walmart will work in traffic. That space that Walmart are trying to get the dirty hand on was specifically designated for a market 20 years ago. But within that 20 years, a huge luxury apartment and a new high school was built just around the corner. Traffic study needs to be updated. We're already at risk. I believe there's a better option. Please pass the ICOs so that further study can be made. Thank you. Thank you. So, are you Alice? Yes. Okay, followed by Zephman Lee, followed by Judy Erickson. Okay, uh, good morning. So, I'm also, my name is Alice. I'm a member of CCED, the Chinatown Community for Equitable Development. We circulated a petition um, through some universities and gathered some signatures from academics and researchers throughout the U.S., and so this is the letter that they wrote, um, that they signed. Uh, we, the undersigned, are academicians to oppose the opening of Walmart in the historic neighborhood of Los Angeles Chinatown. We support the efforts of families, residents, small businesses, and community activists to oppose Walmart, and we call upon all members of the LA City Council to join in this opposition and to support equitable development for this historic neighborhood and all Los Angeles communities. Many of us are associated with ethnic studies and academic discipline born in the late 1960s and early 1970s at the time of similar struggles in historic ethnic enclaves against corporate-driven destruction of low-rent housing and small businesses. As academicians, we realize that our historic ethnic enclaves have nurtured us and shaped our lives and that we have a responsibility to join with community groups such as CCED to protect our communities. We believe that the multi-ethnic... Thank you. Says Man Lee, Alice, oh, that was Alice, Judy Erickson, George Yu. Good morning, my name is Judy Erickson. I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles County Business Federation. Our federation represents more than 100 top business organizations, associations, and trade groups in LA County with more than 185,000 business owners and over 2 million, 2 million employees across LA County. In LA City Council Districts, our federation represents 69,000 business owners. BizFed's Board of Directors is strongly opposed to this ICO in Chinatown, as it represents not only an unfair and unnecessary regulation, but brand discrimination that changes the rules in midstream for a project that has followed all of the city's rules and received all of its permits. The city's own planning commissioners have recommended against this ICO. The city of LA has lost too many jobs and added too many people. BizFed urges you to follow the advice of your own planning commissioners and not move forward with this ICO. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. George Hugh. George, Hugh. George. Doug Arsenault, Maria Elena Durazo, Larry Jung, okay. go right ahead, Doug. Thank you, Council Members. My name is Doug Arson of the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, representing more than 370 businesses that have created over 100,000 jobs. 
We respect the cultural integrity of our city, but this ICO flies in the face of the needs of these communities. Only one mainstream supermarket and a few diversified general merchandise stores currently serve the residents of the downtown area, creating a food desert and limiting access to quality products. This ICO will halt all stores with the capacity to serve these needs, particularly as it is targeted at a project that would replace a long vacant spot in Chinatown with a flourishing market that provides downtown residents with fresh groceries and good jobs. Most troubling is that this ICO will set a precedent, telling large retailers that LA is not interested, that our city is closed for business, a message which will resonate to the San Fernando Valley and hinder our ability to thrive. We ask that you follow the Planning Commission's decision and staff recommendations to reject this ICO. Businesses need to know that they are welcome in our city. Thank you. Maria Elena Durazo. Yes, uh, good morning. And it's great to see Councilman Rosendahl here with us today. Thank you for being here. We... <laughs> Whatever you need, Councilman, we're there for you. Uh, I want to thank Councilman uh, Ed Reyes, and we are here as labor to stand with the Chinatown community in support of the interim control ordinance. We stand with a hundred small businesses in Chinatown that the, are the sole source of income and livelihood for mostly immigrant families. These small businesses have allowed uh, many immigrants to provide for their families. We believe first and foremost in protecting and raising the wages and standards of all Angelinos. And who is big business to come in and tell Chinatown small businesses that they can't make a decision that is the best for their community. So if you really, if you really stand with business, if you really stand with small business, then listen to the Chinatown thank small you. businesses. Thank you, thank you. Okay, you you're going to take away from your you're going to take away from your time okay do do we have larry larry yes uh, good morning i'm larry jung from the los angeles chinatown corporation i'm sorry uh i represent the heritage of several generations that built new chinatown uh, we work and to see the improvement of chinatown now I don't understand why do we need this ICO. Chinatown can decide through its pocket whether large corporations come, come in and survive and serve our community. You know, it was 75 years when Chinatown was a pond and we literally were railroaded out of old Chinatown. We want to decide our own destiny. We thank the other groups who, who try to represent us, but let the small business, the people that live there, decide with their pockets whether large corporations can serve their community. So we urge thank that you. the council... Thank you. Thank you. Yehe Kasijian, I think, Central City Association, Dr. Tom Williams, Will Wright. Identify yourself. Good morning. Yerik Kishishin with the Central City Association. CCA has been and continues to be vehemently opposed to the Chinatown Interim Control Ordinance. The Planning Department's report and recommendation confirms what CCA has said all along. There is no threat of a proliferation of formula retail stores in Chinatown. Any other company, especially a unionized company, would not be subjected to this unnecessary and ill-advised ICO. But this is Walmart, and this is a politically charged environment in which we live. Moving forward with this ICO sets a dangerous precedent. It states to those businesses seeking to invest in the city that they must pass a political litmus test before they are allowed to invest. And we as a city cannot afford to reject jobs. We ask that the city council reject this ICO. The people who stand to benefit the most are the senior citizens residing above this site. They have waited patiently for more than 20 years for a retailer to tenant this long vacant site. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, Gary, Gary Tobin, Will Wright. Go on, Dr. Williams. Dr. Tom Williams, LA 32 Neighborhood Council, also land use uh, chairperson, and we tried to help 
Chinatown and Lincoln Heights regarding the Cornfields Arroyo Seco specific plan and the EIR. So we're kind of concerned as to how this will impact upon the Cornfields specific plan and because it includes the same areas. There's also an issue as to uh, we need a better plan than just the cornfields. It did not include Chinatown. So we need a new plan for the entire area and perhaps this uh, control measure will be able to give us some time if we use it to develop a more general plan for all of Chinatown, cornfields, and the Arroyo Seco. Thank you. Okay, Gary, Gary Tobin, followed by Will Wright, followed by Pastor Bertie Roberts. Good morning, <clears throat> Chairman, uh, President Wesson, and members of the Council. From the business perspective, this vote is all about every business in Los Angeles. Not just big businesses, but every small business as well. It's about the laws and regulations that we have in place in our city and whether we're going to uphold those and live by those. It's about whether we send a message that if you go through, you jump through every hoop and you do it right, whether the rug can be pulled out from under you at the very end, whether you're large business or small. I urge you to vote against this interim control or ordinance. Thank you. Will. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Wright. I work for the American Institute of Architects. We're here to support the planning department's recommendation. Um, this is not about the brand. I think this is really about the process. We're looking at the integrity of the community planning process, and we'd like to find ways to support that process. And I think an investment of our time in an ICO is not the correct way to do that. I don't think it's the most thorough way. I think we really do need to open up the community planning process and look at a specific plan that works for uh, Chinatown and the neighborhood. So we encourage you to follow the planning department's recommendation. That's your staff and human resources that you've invested in and pursue a process that's much cleaner and much more effective and will gain the support of not only the community, the unions, but the business leaders as well. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Good morning, Council. My name is Pastor Bridey Roberts. I am the program director. I apologize. That's all right. I'm the program director at Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice in Los Angeles. We are part of a statewide consortium that works with the faith community on issues of economic justice, and we represent hundreds of congregations in this community. We ask you today to strongly support the passage of an ICO to represent the citizens and small businesses of Chinatown who are telling you that they need you to have faith in them and that they know what is best for their community. As they have had faith in the city by investing for generations in building businesses, planting families, and building a city where they can bring their culture and prosperity and share it with the other residents of this community. Do not turn your back on them. They deserve the right to have a, a stronger voice in this conversation. They feel that they are at immediate risk. And this is about protecting jobs that support families instead of bringing in businesses that will take money out and leave workers impoverished and underrepresented. Carefully consider today what this community has given to the city and to you, and have faith in them. Thank you. James, James Elmendorf, John Walsh, Carrie Gann. John Walsh, Kerry Gann. James? Good morning, Council Members. My name is James Elmendorf from the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. I'm here to ask you to join the residents, the businesses, the workers of the Chinatown community in supporting Council Member Reyes's motion for an interim control ordinance that will ensure we do not have formula retail stores in Chinatown to allow the community to develop a plan for its future rather than having one imposed upon it by Walmart. I do want to make sure that everybody understands there's been concerns that have been expressed about the process here. What you are asked to do today is to vote on an interim control ordinance. This will not affect Walmart unless it is found that Walmart did not comply with the rules. There is an appeal of Walmart's building permits which was heard last week. The ruling will take place over the next couple of weeks and months. 
this ICO will affect Walmart if and only if they violated the rules. So this council can go forward knowing that they are not taking away anyone's rights by voting for the ICO. They are protecting the rights of the Chinatown community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Carrie, followed by John Walsh, followed by John Walsh, followed by Nick Ung. Go right ahead. Good morning, council members. Uh, my name is Carrie Gann, and I'm a longtime resident of L Los Angeles Chinatown. I was born and raised here. I went to Solano Elementary, and I actually, my parents actually moved for better resources elsewhere, but I decided to come back to live here. I live here now as an adult. I have always been a longtime supporter of small businesses here in Chinatown. However, I oppose the proposed ICO because really, come on, I'm, I'm all about bringing, developing this, this city. I love this city and I want it to flourish. I see a lot of us young folk, my roommates included, we want this place to grow. And, you know, similar to Little Tokyo, we want this to be a thriving community. I'm not saying anything about, you know, putting out the mom and pops because I still go there, but I want some place where I can go get my toothpaste, my toilet paper, please. And, you know, I, I strongly encourage you to consider residents who actually live here, not special interest groups, not lobby groups. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Again, uh, John Walsh. Uh, Nikki Ung. Nikki Ung. Good morning, Council. My name is Nikki Young. I'm the Ch Executive Director of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Um, I, I oppose this ICO. This is not about Walmart, guys, and you know this is something that we need in the community. The Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Our mission is trying to is to ensure that we can revitalize Chinatown, to grow the community, to encourage businesses to come and support our community and to be more involved. This ICO is going to block that. This is not going to help our community, and I urge the council to reconsider this. Um, a lot of you have probably made up your mind, but please remember that this is supposed to be something for the community, something that we need to do for those that live and thrive here. Um, this proposed ICO does not reflect the needs of the Chinatown community, and it definitely unfairly limits our community's ability to choose where to shop, eat, and work. I have a list of letters for the council president here from our community and from um, our leaders as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you could give those to the sergeants, please. Okay, David Garcia, Dan Hindman, and Tom Hancock. Yes, sir. Please go forward. Good morning, council members. Good morning, council members. My name is David Garcia. I am a warehouse worker out in the Inland Empire. Um, we deliver pro uh, Walmart products good, 100%. At the store that is going to be built in Los Angeles, it's not just a, a, a neighborhood market. It's a much larger, larger corporation. This corporation could afford to do better, but they choose not to. I am also uh, part of the 85,000 employers working there, and we work through an agency that's contracted by Walmart. That uh, where there there is literally no job security for us. We get paid under under minimum wage. Um, we also uh, just man, there's just no job security, you guys. And uh, I also like to say. Please pass the uh, ICO, please, today. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Dan. Dan Hinman, Tom Hancock, and Sissy Trin. Yes, young man. How are you doing, City Councilman? Uh, my name is Dan Hinman. I work for Walmart three and a half years. Um, I really kind of want to say I do enjoy my job, but it can be better. By you building a a Walmart in, in Chinatown, it would pretty much destroy a lot of businesses. Um, I really don't go through Chinatown, but I know how Walmart works. I work in the store. I slave every day for the customers, for Walmart to make their pockets fatter. It's not, it's not good. I mean, you open a Walmart inside Chinatown, I mean, a lot of businesses are going to, are going to be demolished. I have a son I have to support every day, and I, I come home with 12, what, 20 hours a week? And my check after, after everything is like $150. How am I going to feed my son? Now, not just me and everybody else that works for Walmart. 
You know, I mean, what about everybody else that, that shops at Walmart? I mean, this is this is not something we're asking for. We we totally we're totally against we're totally are with ICO, and we would love if you guys you know help us out with this. I mean, this is Walmart can do better. They choose not to. They know they can. I mean, we go on strike. We do everything we can to let Walmart know we're not here to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming down, Tom Hancock. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, council members. My name is Tom Hancock. I work at Pavilions Market, and because I've been a union member for 29 years, I make 1980, and I have affordable health care. <clears throat> I'm here to support the ICO before you today because I believe bad employers like Walmart could eventually destroy good jobs like mine. We've already seen it happening with Albertsons, which has had to close stores because they can't compete with the beh behemoth Walmart. Walmart has promised community leaders that they will pay $13 an hour at the Chinatown and Lamert stores, but their actual pay is well below that. They clearly have the resources to offer good jobs with affordable benefits, but like the man says, they choose not to. That's why I oppose another Walmart coming to L.A., and I'll continue to stand with everyone who is here today uh, to fight poverty jobs. Please vote yes on the ICO. Thank you. Thank you. Sissy Trin. Good morning, council members. Thank you for um, this hearing today. My name is Sissy Trin. I'm the executive director of the Southeast Asian Community Alliance. We represent low-income youth and families in the Chinatown area, and we're here to support the ICO. For us, the ICO is basically just a timeout. It's a temporary measure so that we can see what the economic impact is going to be on Chinatown. You know, CEQA requires that we do an environmental impact whenever a new development comes in. And here we're talking about a company that is bigger than Chevron, Pfizer, and like four of the other largest corporations in the world combined. You know, we need an ICO so that we can see what's going to happen to the future of Chinatown businesses. I have a stack here of hundreds of letters from local businesses that are in support of the ICO. Right? We need the time to think through what's going to happen, because what we know right now, there are 30 businesses that are directly in competition that will be shut down if Walmart Thanks. comes in. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. City Attorney, that concludes public comment on this item. Mr. Reyes to open. Thank you, Council President. Colleagues, in front of you is 29A. 29A is the ordinance that is being decided upon today. There was a point when we had a body of people through the Community Redevelopment Agency. Those individuals would have been in a place where they could have assessed these applications. They could have assessed the permit requests. And they would have told us that yes, this market is empty for so many years. And yes, we do have a candidate to fill this market. But what's different, council member, is that now you have a high school across the street. That high school did not exist when this market was entitled. It did not exist. And council member, you've had so many accidents on that intersection. And yes, council member, there was an elderly woman who was struck by a bus because the sidewalk was so crowded given the number of students and people on that sidewalk. We have a public safety issue here. So when they bring their permits, let's design an intersection that can promote public safety, talk about wider sidewalks, and look at conditions that would make it safer, council member. But colleagues, I don't have that anymore. I don't have the ability to break down those issues. When that store was entitled, there was no high school. Today you have hundreds and hundreds of kids on that intersection on peak hours. I have a major 
freeway on ramp and off ramp near that intersection. This is what's important to me. What's also important is that Chinatown is precious. Chinatown has a history. It has wonderful landmarks. It is a global destination for tourists. What makes it unique are its small shops. What makes it unique are its small restaurants. What makes it unique is how our immigrants, this amazing umbilical cord that connects to all the Southeast Asian communities that are reflected in each store that gives us that richness is what we can preserve. I don't have design guidelines. I don't have a massing study. I don't have that which speaks to preferred parking. I don't have a place where we can look at shuttles. I don't have that in Chinatown right now. All I'm asking is for a pause. Contrary to what the CCA is saying in the chamber, I'm not stopping business. I'm not preventing business. I want to accentuate it. I want to build it so that it's safe and desirable to be there. But why not allow the current small businesses and medium-sized businesses to be a part of a process so that we can look at how we can study architecture, massing, building, circulation. All the ICO does is allows me the opportunity to pay attention to all of my bosses, all of my constituents. As it's been stated, Walmart has its permits. It's going to go through its process. I'm concerned with how we look at these beautiful enclaves that are historic in nature, and how do we create compatibility? How do we create the fit? And how do we address this whole array of interests in a balanced manner? So 40% of the planning staff is gone. The CRA is gone. I'm asking you to support me on this ICO. Now, as Chair of Plum for the last 11 years, I try my best to give you and each one of us the weight you deserve as the elected official of that district. I'm asking you to give me the same understanding and opportunity to address this very complex issue. That's all I'm asking. I ask you for an I vote on 29A. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. <laughs> Mr. Uh... Mr. Uh, Alacon. Council members, uh, I think all of us have had our own personal experiences with Chinatown, probably dating back to when we were kids. I know when we had special events, uh, when I was just a little kid, we used to come to Chinatown to celebrate <clears throat> in another culture and experience the fascination with Chinatown as it was. I can hardly imagine a Chinatown where the, the gateway is a Walmart. It, it just doesn't fit into the notion of what most of us think of Chinatown being. And, and I think it's wrong to change the nature of what uh, Chinatown is. It would, be, it would be extremely sad if if we allow a Walmart to thrive at the expense of cutting out 20 or 30 other local businesses that could detract from the whole notion of what the Chinatown experience is. And so I, I think it's an inconsistent uh, use. It's inconsistent with the cultural heritage of the community, and I believe it's inconsistent with the concept of cultural sites. Okay, so now. So uh, I'm very pleased to support the ICO to take a time out. Uh, and I was happy to second Mr. Kokorian's motion to ensure that if we are going to consider a Walmart, uh, that we know, need to know what the economic impacts are. We need to know uh, specifically what stores are going to be affected. Now, you cannot tell me that you can place uh, a Walmart in the middle of, of Chinatown or at the gateway, as I said, uh, and not impact the small businesses. It will detract from those other businesses. That's, that's my, my theory, uh, but we can prove that with a study. Uh, I think we moved too quickly on the approvals of the Walmart originally and the entitlements, uh, we meaning the city's process, not, not us as a group. 
And, and I think sometimes uh, it takes leadership to take a time out and, and study things uh, beyond what the process uh, has been able to evaluate. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. An ICO will give us the opportunity to assess whether or not it's going to have a negative impact on local businesses in the community. Uh, and I would, I would uh, argue that, that if it does, it's going to detract from the whole notion of what Chinatown is. And, and uh, ultimately, uh, I personally don't need a study. I don't think it's any surprise to anybody to know where, where my heart would land on, on this issue. Um, and so uh, I want to commend uh, Councilmember Reyes for uh, his tenacity and stick to on, on this issue. Uh, very late in the game, it's very difficult to un unfold these processes once they have uh, wound their way down the road. Uh, but sometimes uh, it takes that kind of leadership uh, to make things happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Parks. Thank you. Could I ask the planning director to come up, please? I'd just like to get a couple of issues clarified as to just exactly what's before us and also what impact, because I think the last time this came before council, uh, there was discussions about building permits already being taken out and that this was not an effort to stop that particular project, but then we hear the conversation as though this is a Walmart-directed uh, initiative. So I need to find out legally where we are and where we are as it relates to what's before us, what your commission has done, what your department has recommended. Okay. Michael Legrand for the record. Uh, what's before you is an interim control ordinance to halt the issuance of building permits for what we call formula retail stores um, to preserve the character of Chinatown, as the council members discussed. Um, that was um, by a motion in March of March 23rd of 2012. The planning department went back. We drafted the interim control ordinance, presented it to the planning commission. On July 12th of 2012, the planning commission voted 5-2 to disapprove the motion based off staff's recommendation and the testimony they took at that time. Um, so we recommended disapproval of the ICO, um, and the planning commission um, disapproved it and recommended disapproval to you. Um, August 14, 2012, um, Plum voted 2-1 to one, um, to recommend the ordinance to the City Council. Um, many issues were brought up at the Plum hearing, including public safety, sensitivity of the community, quality of life, and the scale of developments. Um, there are many speakers at that hearing also. Um, in terms of building permits issued for the subject property site that's um, been discussed today, there is an appeal of a building permit that was issued by the planning department, and was actually issued by Building and Safety, but cleared by the planning department to be issued. Um, that appeal went before a zoning administrator under 1226K of our code. We have a process where a zoning administrator hears those cases, and that went last week. They haven't made a decision on that appeal today. Um, the city attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, depending upon the outcome of that hearing, they'll be able to um, this ICO um, could impact them if their building permit is found to not be valid. If it's found valid, I don't believe that this ordinance before you um, would have an impact on that site. What, what do you mean by the word valid? What, what would that encompass? Um, issued valid that there wasn't an error or abuse of discretion of the Department of Building and Safety in issuing that building permit. They came in for what was called a tenant improvement permit, um, to, which is an um, administrative type permit. And the department has a clearance that goes to the planning department and other departments to make sure that prior activity in the case has been cleared and that any conditions of approval from any property um, that has conditions on there have been cleared and reviewed and that had taken place. Um, a concerned citizen then appealed that building permit under the code provision that allows for that, 1226K. Um, and that has gone before the zoning administrator for a public hearing, and they're in the midst of rendering a decision. But that decision isn't available yet. Okay. Let me ask you one other thing. Is that are there legal issues that we're stepping into if retroactively, and if I understand it correctly, the building permits were issued, we understood that work has been moving forward to uh, impact that particular store. What are the legal implications if, if all of a sudden you go retroactively to stop that process? Well, I see my partner here, Ken Fong, from the city attorney's office. I'll have him address that. All right. If you don't, if you don't mind, Councilman, I'll just address that briefly. 
Walmart right now has their permits. Uh, as uh, Mr. Legrand uh, uh, mentioned, those have been appealed. Uh, if the decision of the zoning administrator is to uphold those permits, this ICO will have no effect on Walmart because it will all, all already have its permits and it will have a vested right to build. So really, you should just look at this ICO uh, on its own merits, whether it's necessary uh, you know, to allow study uh, of permanent uh, zoning measures in Chinatown. And, and, and the, uh, the permit in, um, for Walmart will be a separate issue. So are you saying that the, your belief is that the permit is all legal and there are no Well, no, my, my, uh, my understanding is that the permit was already issued to Walmart. That permit has been appealed. It's, it's possible that the permit will be revoked. Uh, after the zoning administrator's decision, or it's possible that the zoning administrator will uphold the permit. But we don't know yet. Last so that's question, Mr. Parks, and then push your button again. Okay. Let me just ask one question. Do we know if work has started? Uh, I don't know. Do you, I, I assume that it has, but I don't know. Maybe other staff knows for sure. Mike LeGrand, for the record, I believe some work has begun, but not work that would um, be necessary regarding that permit prior to the appeal to the permit. Thank you. Mr. Weizar. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, something that struck me was um, something Mr. Reyes mentioned right now. And he's been chairing Plum for, since I've been here, even before that, last six, seven years, last seven years. And one thing that I've noticed as vice chair, and looking at Mr. Reyes as chair, is that he's always been very respectful of other council members' wishes when it comes to land use issues in their districts. Whether it's the right way or the wrong way to do business in the city, you know, we could always discuss. But nonetheless, that has been the practice uh, of the Plump Committee for a very long time. Mr. Reyes now has a vision for the future of his district. He puts forward to us uh, a proposal that will preserve the character of our beloved Chinatown. Uh, and this is something that in any or, or other ordinary case we would respect and we'd give the local council member uh, the uh, wishes that he would like to see in his district uh, when it comes to land use matters. And that's what's precisely before us. You've heard our city attorney, you've heard our general manager of our planning department, and so colleagues, um, this is one of those where if we want to continue on that path, I would ask that we respect the local council member on land use matters and we move forward uh, with this matter. It's got a lot of attention, it's got a lot of uh, heightened uh, uh, attention throughout the city, but when it comes down to it, um, when we look at a neighborhood like Chinatown and we ask ourselves what type of future does this neighborhood deserve, I'm sure we would all agree that we would want to preserve the historic character of this beautiful neighborhood. Thank you. Mr. Englander. Well, well said, and, and I absolutely agree, and, and uh, in fact, let me echo that even further, Mr. Wiesar. Um, that I absolutely agree that uh, it, it should be the way we actually do business uh, in looking at council members and land use issues in their own district because who knows those areas more. In fact, I take it a step further as I know many of you do uh, in, and, I, and I take this from, from Mr. Uh, Rosendahl's playbook um, that we give all land use issues first to the neighborhood councils and the people in the area to weigh in on first um, as our advisors as well and have worked very closely to, to copy that and echo that. So I do appreciate that. The only time that I really ever uh, look at other issues outside of uh, district specific really um, in general are the, whether they're regional in nature um, and they have a regional impact uh, at all, uh, whether those are hospitals or airports or whatever those might be. Um, and the other one is whether they have a serious financial um, risk or hardship to the city as a whole as well. And so that's where I've sort of looked at this one. In, um, and, and from what you're saying, Mr. Legrand, uh, the commission looked at all this as well from the same perspective as what you were saying, and which is why they voted uh, no on the ICO is, I, I think, what you were alluding to. The question is, and I think it, it goes on the heels of what Mr. Parks was asking, if, in fact, uh, from what you're stating, uh, let's assume that it was the ZA and, they, and that appeal is still being heard right now, um, 
and they uh, uphold the permits and don't deny and th they deny the appeal and we move forward with this ICO today you're saying there's no impact to the current permitting for those businesses but the question is what if the city then still decided to withhold against the ZA's um, appeal and in light of what you're saying are we could we be at financial risk um, and would we have the chance of even winning any kind of lawsuit like that? Uh, Ken Fong, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, yes, uh, the, you know, there's always a risk when you have an issued building permit and then you revoke it. I would assume that there would be litigation. We don't have that litigation at this point, but yes, I would say that there would be a risk. And, I, and I'm not suggesting, my question isn't if we revoked it because the ZA upheld the appeal. What I'm asking is if the ZA denied the appeal, because they would have to have grounds for upholding the appeal. If they denied the appeal, we move forward with the ICO and then pull back the permits. Um, what, would, what would happen then? I don't, I don't quite understand. Yeah, uh, I, be, I believe we wouldn't be have the ability to revoke the permits if the ZA um, denies the appeal before them. So under 1226K, there's an appeal before the director, which we delegate to the zoning administrator. If the zoning administrator finds there is no error, abuse, and discretion by the permit issuing agencies, um, then that permit would be valid. They would go ahead and, be, and build, and there would be no revocation of that permit. What's the timing of getting the, uh, the, the appeal finalized? Where's, where are things? Yeah, we're probably um, 30 to 60 days away from a decision on that. Okay. And th do they continue to build while that's being heard, or is there a timeout? Uh, Deputy City Attorney again. Uh, any applicant that has a building permit in a revocation process, uh, they can build, but it would be at their own risk because if they build and then the permit is ultimately revoked, then they would have to take down the structure. So it seems to me the whole process really hinges on the ZA's yes, that's right. approval, not this. Okay, thank you. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. I wasn't going to speak on this and just let my vote speak for itself, but I did want to stand up because I think a lot of what I heard, there's folks who made this into uh, an argument about one company. And if it were about that one company or other companies like that, I think we could make a pretty compelling case, which is not what Mr. Reyes came to me when the original motion, he came forward and asked me to second it. It was about making sure he could take care of his community and the issues that he had there. But let's pretend for a moment it is because there's a false dichotomy that's been set up here between if you vote for this ICO, you're anti-business. If you vote against it, you're pro-business and vice versa. We need a wider conversation about our economy, folks. One store coming into one neighborhood that moves jobs from one place to the next and that most likely are going to be a lower wage job with fewer benefits is not a conversation about economic growth in the city. Now, it's one thing if we're talking about a new company coming in here, but to talk about Shifting jobs from one place to the next then gets down to the issue of neighborhood convenience, which I'll get to in a second. But we should be having bigger fights or, better yet, collaboration about building real jobs here, encouraging more tourists to come down to Los Angeles, about making sure that we have health care career ladders like we've developed or job training centers in our community colleges to invest in infrastructure and transit to open trade offices in Latin America and Asia, things where there's no division, by the way, between any of us in this city, but if we spent half the time on that that we do on these things. You know, I was very proud to write a superstore ordinance in this city, and it didn't target any one company. There's superstores by Target, by Walmart, at the time by Kmart. And what we said with that is, we're not banning you there. We said, make the case that you're actually going to produce more jobs and have a greater economic benefit than not. And that was challenged in court, and we won every step of the way. It's been copied in other cities. And guess what? No superstore has opened up that is a big box with a grocery because nobody can make that case. And even if they were able to open up, we wouldn't have an increase in gross receipts in the city. We wouldn't have a net increase in employment. So this becomes a little bit more ideological than really about growing the pie. So let's have a deeper conversation about whether we're going to have an economy that rushes to making sure that warehouse workers are just 20 hours a week and that it's seniors who work at a Walmart to greet people or adults who then have to be on food stamps while they're working full time and go to emergency rooms for their health care or whether we in the city...
stand for something bigger. Let's have that conversation, but that's not the conversation here today. The conversation here today is a chairman of our Planning Land Use Management Committee that's given us that courtesy every single time. When people say, why do you just respect what your other council members do? It's because I know how hard each one of these 15 people works in their community. We work seven days a week. We're never off the job. We go to the grocery store and we're talking to folks. We go to the, the dry cleaner and they're asking about a small business loan. And we're closer to what people say. Of course, there's people for this and against it, but I'm going to trust the council member that's there who has a concern about convenience, not just about where you can get the toilet paper, but also whether you can cross the street safely. And to allow there to be the space for us to look at this, assess it, and have a sober decision. But let's move on from this decision, and let's talk about the bigger things in the economy, how we're going to get living wages and benefits, and grow this pie once and for all. Mr. LaBange. Thank you very much. Hey Ed, I got out of high school in two and a half years because when I was in high school, there was a high school, a technical school, and I'd go on Saturday there where the Board of Education is, so I'm very familiar with the neighborhood. And one of the challenges in adaptive reuse is whatever the market is, is the impacts on the neighborhood. And one thing Mr. Reyes is, is very familiar, as Mr. Garcetti said, with the neighborhoods of his district. And the impacts of large trucks coming into the area north of what was Sunset Boulevard, Cesar Chavez, Grand Avenue. How is that going to be impacted? You need to look at it with different eyes. We all want jobs everywhere. We all want new businesses everywhere. And also, it's a dynamic thing because in living all 59 years in the middle of the city, in the Silver Lake District, there never was these big type stores in our regions. It was always out in the valley or somewhere else in the city. So take a fresh look at it would be helpful for everybody and the right to make the right steps as we go on. I welcome all business, which is real important for Los Angeles, but at the same time, you're adapting to reuse of what was one of the first, if I believe, first, uh, what do you call that, Mr. Legrand? Mixed use. It was the first mixed use right there at Grand uh, long ago, and I don't know if it was a young Mike Hernandez or a middle-aged Mike Hernandez or if it was Gloria Molina when it was. It was Gloria Molina back when the first district came in before that. So I think to take a good look at it is real important and then come back and, and do what the right thing is because it is uh, a great neighborhood. I was in Chinatown last night. I was at Yang Chow. Billy wasn't working, but you can't beat Yang Chow. Let's hear for Chinatown. Mr. Mr. Zein. Mr. Zein. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Uh, Ed Reyes, we came into office together almost 12 years ago. You've been on Plum that whole time. I spend little time on Plum with you. Uh, and I know that uh, each of us has issues in our districts. I've got a uh, Costco that wants to go in in Woodland Hills area. It's being blocked, a uh, court decision. I've got an uh, elder care facility that wants to go in. It's being blocked by a court litigation. And I've supported both of these to build the jobs, to build the opportunities, to have a place for our seniors instead of putting them out in industrial area, put them in an area where they have the convenience. And this council supported my position on those matters. And I think it's incumbent that we look to you, who's the representative for that particular area, with your expertise in planning from the river to your district, the first district, and what you've committed to over the years. I'm a pro-business person. I'm very pro-business. I'm not telling no to business. I'm not telling them to go someplace else. I support the gross receipts tax reduction. I support all of the issues. And I look at Glendale, no gross receipts tax, no business tax, no tax on anything. They're recruiting business. We want to recruit business here in Los Angeles. But I also respect the fact that you're familiar with that area more than me, even though I pass it as I travel in the downtown area, and the fact that we have to show some respect to the representative for that area and the people in that area. So I look at this as a broad picture to say we're either going to support you and you're going to support me because I know best about my district. I don't know the last time you went out to Topanga and Victory to see that area, but the fact is, Joe, down in San Pedro, I was down on the port recently. They want to do some renovation down there. I'm going to support you, what you want to do with that area on the waterfront. The fact is we need to have the alliance together to help the city and not tell business we're not supportive. This morning I heard on the radio that the NFL doesn't want the stadium, the farmers field. Now they want to go to Dodger Stadium and they want to negotiate that. So it changes all the time. That's your area too, Mr. Reyes, by the way, as you know, as you well know. So now you've got the NFL, instead of talking about Farmer's Field, now they want to go according to the latest report. So I'm going to support you on this matter because it's with your insight, knowledge, and experience that you know what you want to do for the community. And I'm going to support that 
But I'm not telling Gary Tobin from the chamber that I don't support business, that we want to push business out of Los Angeles. But we've got to take these issues and we have to look at these issues and have some respect in showing for the person who represents that area, who is elected to represent that area. And it's not about labor versus management. It's about an issue that is concerned of safety, concerned of the community, concerned of what you want for your district. You're the elected representative and I do support you in that. So I'm voting for you. Thank you. Bill Rosendahl. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I apologize for not standing, but uh, I'm working on a situation here that I hope I beat over the next uh, six months to a year and a half. Great, 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 great is indeed what Dennis says. Look, Ed is my seatmate. He and I have sat next to each other for the last eight years. We talk a lot about a lot of issues, but always we go back to what's important for our communities that we serve. The more you know your community, the more effective as a politician you are. As, as I heard one of my colleagues say, Mr. Englander and Ms. Ghani, everywhere I go, people come up to me with issues, and I'm open to it. This is another one of those process-oriented issues. I know there's an elephant in the room that we're on the verge of not talking about, but you know, living wages and health care benefits are critical for us in this great society. And if our federal government can't do it, business has a responsibility to work on it. Look, I come from the private sector. I ran a conglomerate with 2,700 employees. I know all about business. I know all about profits. I know how it all works, okay? But you know, we put in a, a program for my workers, a 401k, which we didn't have for the workers. The rich got rich and my workers got nothing. But I sat with the chairman of the board, Leonard Tao, and convinced him it was in his best interest to have a happy worker. Happy worker means happy customers, means profits increase. So we like win-win situations here. So first, I support my colleague, the prerogative of my colleague, to take a process that makes sense to him. I don't know his district as much as anybody else in the district. I mean, I have friends who spend a lot of time there. The art community is there big time also in that community. But I also believe that we need to appreciate the fact that this great nation of ours this great nation of ours. There should be living wages, there should be health care, and we need to move forward on that direction. So yes, seatmate, you got my support, and I look forward to us supporting this overall. Thank you, Mr. President. No, thank you, Mr. Rosendahl, you know, for coming out because you realize this was a very important issue, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Parks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just would like to say one of the things I think is important and certainly a lot of philosophical things have been mentioned today. And since I've been here, what I find that those who have the most concern about high wages, high benefits, are generally those who have a job. I just happen to represent a large number of people, that 250,000 people, and only 15,000 jobs are in that district. And so when you hear this about groceries, the reason we're a food desert is because we've been abandoned by grocery stores. And then we get those same stores and their union members fighting against independents coming into the same community to support them. So my community goes without groceries because the national brands won't come in and they fight those who want to come in. And then when the national brands leave, they always turn the property over to a clothing store or a 99 cent store, so there is no groceries. So we are being held hostage over philosophical views and particularly this age-old discussion about high benefits, high wages. In many instances, they don't go to the community that we're talking about. They're being, people are brought into those communities to work in those high-powered jobs. And so I think this whole issue that we're going around and around in a circle, and I could agree with Mr. Garcetti about what real economic development is, except in this case, this building has been vacant for 30 years, entitled for 30 years to have a grocery store, and no one moved into it. So to quibble about whether we're moving jobs or changing jobs today, I think is a red herring. The issue is there's groceries that are needed, it's a food desert, there's business that is needed, there's taxes that will be paid, or do we benefit by having that vacant store for another 30 years while we quibble about what brand goes on the door? And I would hope as we talk about each district and talk about what people and the, the real belief that the local council person should have a say, 
I just hope that benevolence is here when we have the USC project that everyone in this council believes they're more expert than the local officials that are responsible. Mr. Uh, Reyes to close. <sighs> Colleagues, I want to see jobs. I want to see jobs created. You can create jobs when you have safe streets. You have desirable places to walk to and from. When there's predictability with parking. When we know that when that big truck comes into that market, a market that was designed, Concert Parks, before a school went in, that school now creates an environment that was never accounted for. The technical school that Councilor LaBange referred to was shut down for years. It became an administration building. So I am fighting for safer streets. I am fighting for jobs because desirability promotes more customers. More customers means more business. More business means more jobs. So this is a job-friendly request. I'm just asking for us to allow the planning department to get with the stakeholders to design and reinforce the type of designs, the type of analysis, the type of preservation efforts that reinforces the character, quality, and diversity and unique architecture that makes Chinatown such a beautiful destination and we can enhance that in the future. I'd hate for Broadway to turn into Main Street suburbia. I have nothing against suburbia. It happened to grow when it did. This area is unique because of its history and character. So again, I, I thank my colleagues for your support. I thank my colleagues for your understanding. This project has its permits. I'm not stopping it. There's an appeal process that's going through its stages. I'm just asking you to help me provide an environment that's safer and that makes more sense and that reinforces the character of Chinatown. That's all I'm asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Uh, Madam Clerk, for an announcement. Yes, Mr. President, um, a minimum of 12 unanimous votes are required for the ordinance to pass on first reading. Okay, Mr. Reyes, you ready? Okay, Madam Clerk, we're going to prepare to vote, so let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes, four noes. The ordinance pursuant to Council Rule 53, the ordinance will be held over to tomorrow. Thank Council you. Council meeting. Okay, is there any more business before this council? Madam Clerk, any more business before this body? Not in the special meeting. Do you wish to adjourn the special meeting and return to the regular? Yes, let's adjourn this meeting and return to the regular meeting. Item 28, the closed session item, um, remains for council consideration. Okay. Mr. Kikorian, has anything, has anything changed? Is the uh, sergeants, are the, is the back office clear? Okay, members, let's quick. The lawyer's not here. Okay, so let's adjourn. Not adjourn. Do we, Mr. City Attorney, do we have a timeline? <laughs> Mr. Kikorian, why don't we continue this until tomorrow? Paul? Okay, then I'm going to continue this item till tomorrow. Dion, your people have to be here. Mr. Garcetti? My, my people are en route right now. They're, they are here no, they should have been here. Uh, Mr. Garcetti? Okay. Uh, that 28 is uh, continued till tomorrow. Is there any more business before this committee? Council has motions for posted and referral. They are posted and referred. Announcements? Announcements, members? Adjourning motions, can we please rise? 
Any adjourning motions? Everybody? Mr. Hernandez, let's rise. Rise for adjourning motions. And if we could have it, shh, avoc. Mr. Rosendahl. Yes, and I apologize, colleagues, for not standing. Uh, you don't have to apologize. Well, you know, I hope I get to that point soon enough to do it. But this is about my dear friend, Jackie Guthrie. Uh, I've been her best friend for many years, and she died on Sunday. I had a chance to talk to her a few days before she passed, and then when she passed, her husband, my dear friend Arlo Guthrie, called me and told me of her passing. Uh, an amazing lady that was totally there for her husband and her children, and actually helped create the Guthrie business, which has been very successful over the years. She was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, but was, was raised in Malibu, California. She met Arlo in 1968 while working as a cashier at the Troubadour, the Hollywood nightclub, which was the epicenter for folk music. In fact, she spent a year with me working on a movie on the guy who created that place. The very next year, the couple purchased a 250-acre property called The Farm, where the family still owns in Washington, Massachusetts. I've been up there many times. It's a wonderful spot. They were married on the front lawn of the farm in October of 1969. The couple raised four children, Abe, Kathy, Annie, and Sarah Lee. In recent years, the family toured together with Jackie working as a videographer. This past summer, the family toured to celebrate the centennial birthday of Arlo's father, folk singer Woody Guthrie, and Jan Perry knows she dedicated a street there in an area uh, to the Guthries. While on tour, Jack, suddenly Jackie fell ill. In early September, things took a turn for the worst, and she was diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer. Jackie is survived by her four children, her loving husband, uh, and she daughter, uh, you know, Sarah Lee is with a guy, and they have a couple of three kids, Johnny Iron, and they have a band, and they actually played a role in us uh, raising money for the middle school and sending those folks off to the Olympics. Arlo and Jackie had a beautiful, loving relationship, and they had just celebrated their 43rd wedding anniversary. I'd like to read a passage from a recent Facebook post made by Arlo. Quote, there were loves and there are loves. Ours was the will to continue no matter what. A very great love. We didn't always like each other. From time to time, there were moments when we had our bags packed by the door. But there was this great love that we shared from the moment we met. A recognition. It's you. And we would always return to it year after year, decade after decade. And I believe in this life and in a lifetime. Jackie is a sister and beloved spirit to me. Uh, she was living in my heart and joined the list of saints I prayed to every morning. I might add that in 1976, we toured the country in a bus for 30 days. We did 27 concerts throughout the country to raise money for Fred Harris's presidential bid. But we bonded on that bus and have remained close friends ever since. The first blunder bus came from a deal that Arlo and I struck that night in Manchester, New Hampshire. He had just finished This Land is Your Land, his father's song. We sat and had a pitcher of beer, and we cut a deal that I would pay for the bus until it ended and whatever the remaining purchase price he would pick it up and that became the first rolling blunder review so deep memories deep thoughts and another great saint that I can pray to uh, for love and support may she rest in peace thank you Mr. Uh, LaBange thank you very much God bless the Guthrie family Mr. Rosendahl last we adjourned a memory of Don Goodwin who is a co-founder of the Large Mod Quantical uh, she lived to be 70 six years old. She was a tremendous person and an asset to really the Wilshire area that we share, Mr. Wesson, and all the years of working to get the news out in the community. Mr. Koretz as well, I'd like you to ask and sign on that as well. Uh, she was also a big backer of the YMCA uh, and all the work that was done uh, for the Wilshire YMCA, which is being expanded and included. Additionally, uh, members, Mr. President, I ask uh, we adjourn a member of a great American uh, George McGovern. George McGovern, U.S. Senator, uh, candidate for president in 1972. I remember that very well because we just got to be 18. We're right about there, the first time we could vote. You never forget the first guy 
You ever vote for it, that George? That was my McGovern, first vote, line. too. First, we're all right in there. We're all my right in there. Vote. Very special time. So a great American uh, who served this country well, George McCubbin, asked we all adjourn in his memory. Okay, Mr. Rosendahl wanted to piggyback on that. Thank you very much for that comment. Many of you know I worked for George McGovern for 18 months. Uh, and ran the state of Illinois in the primary. I helped set up his National Finance Committee. And in the last 10 weeks, I traveled with him across the country in a 727. I would tuck him in at night, wake him up in the morning, and he was the most incredible, decent guy. It was 3 o'clock in the morning when we all stood there and he got the nomination. We all knew he was going to lose. And a little tidbit of history, uh, in the middle of the afternoon of Election Day, we were in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he went and took a nap. Uh, when he came out of, out of the bedroom, he asked, how did I do? Well, he had lost everything except Massachusetts, and he had actually lost South Dakota. Everybody stormed out of the room but me. Everybody was crying, and I unfortunately had to tell him uh, that he had lost. And he said, well, what about my home state? And I said, it's too early to tell. I didn't have a chance to t I just couldn't tell him at that point. Uh, but he was a loving man. He was a spirit. He and I spoke together three weeks ago. He ho heard of my illness, and he gave me his goodwill. And he said, Bill, stay positive. That always works. You know, he was just about 90 at the time. And i got to tell you, folks, inspirational people are very important to all of us in our lives. And that has helped me through my life to have such great heroes who believe that we can make the world a better place and that we all should continue to focus on that. May George rest in peace. Mr. Weizar. Thank you, Mr. President. And it's uh, with sadness that I ask that we adjourn in memory of the father of a great senior lead officer that we have in the northeast uh, part of the city, uh, Craig Orange. And his father is Theodore Charles Orange, a.k.a. TC. Uh, we, uh, he was affectionately known as TC, and he was born in Pirtle, Texas on January 29, 1931, to Sally Meadowlock and Forrest Orange, and was the sixth of seven children. TC met Elia Greer, his future wife, while in high school at Tyler, Texas. Soon after high school, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. In 1951, he married Ella, with whom he shared 24 years together and had three children, Sheila, Carrie, and Craig. In 1957, after being discharged from the U.S. Army, TC and his family moved to Pasadena, California. TC worked at the Broadway Department Store in downtown LA for a few years before deciding to start his own carpeting business in Pas the Pasadena area. In 1975, TC met Bess, his second wife, who had a son, Eric, and blended their two families together. In 1995, after retiring from his carpeting business, TC married his third wife, Cassandra, and moved to Mesquite, Texas, with her son, DeMarcus. And in, 19, in 2008, TC returned to California and lived in Highland Park. He is survived by several children and grandchildren. He touched many lives. He will be missed by many. And I know he certainly will be missed by his son, Craig Orange, who just does a wonderful job as a senior lead officer in the Eagle Rock Northeast part of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, any more adjourning motions? This meeting, members, is adjourned.